Um, I want to thank them for being here. Uh, Gus is a photographer of international note, uh, what we call, a, what I call a real world witness photographer. Um, a member of our faculty who does many workshops and many engagements, but also works uh, as on assignment and on commission and uh, editorially in the traditional sense. And of course, he's worked with Liz the best over many years, uh, at first, I think, with uh, the New Yorker magazine back in the heyday of Elizabeth's editorial, photographic editorial ship of that distinguished uh, journal. Um, I think we should just begin and turn it over to them. Uh, as all of you know, those who haven't attended these, this is kind of freewheeling. It, it is uh, the department's contribution to continuing and helping all of us learn and engage with each other as a community of lens and screen arts uh, people. So thank you for being here and thank you Elizabeth and Gus in advance. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you Charlie. Um, I mean, we're grateful that Charlie did the introduction so now we're sort of spared having to do that. We were gonna do that of each other, but, but one thing that sort of the, the introduction leads to is the dialogue that Elizabeth and I have had through collaboration uh, for about 20 years. Uh, and we first met when I was, uh, I first interviewed to be Elizabeth's assistant at the New Yorker, but she didn't accept me for that task. Uh, but luckily she brought me in later on to work as a photo editor and, uh, and to work with her there. And I think, you know, one thing we wanted to talk a little bit about was just that, the, the history of, of how we worked um, together there. But I think Elizabeth, do you agree, should we just sort of just jump into really just speaking right about this present moment? Or do you want to show a little bit of that, that past history? Well, let's talk just a little bit because um, uh, it includes um, it includes how we connect with each other. Um, so, Gus, as he just said, was a um, started out as a fiction researcher, and then um, he very uh, quickly <laughs> started a project which I wasn't aware of, and uh, it turned into a wonderful book called Lunchtime Pictures. And um, so during lunchtime, he went out and sometimes he made his desk look like he was back working when he had to take 10 more minutes. So anyway, these were done while he was working. And the premise was, was really me trying to find a way to make something out of the time and space that was available to me. And in this case, it was on my way to work and during lunch and after work. And in some cases, something significant happened and in other cases, nothing happened. It was really just watching the flow of people and light in Midtown. But always looking for these kind of small little narrative gifts that could tell a story and that could feed me. I mean, that's really what this experience was. I mean, I loved working at the magazine and was so grateful for every part of my experience there, but making these pictures and bearing witness to the life on the streets of the city and trying to find something that I could bring back with me, even if it wasn't successful, but just the thought that it might be, was really what kept me going um, as a young person with a day job, trying to find my path as a visual artist. And I think it's great how you used your time, you know, you just used it so well. And over how much period of time did you do that? From around 99 to 2003 or so was when the pictures were being made. And then the book was published in 2003. And then the first, and it was the first thing I ever really got published properly, which was, uh, this was one of the pictures that was in double take. And, and that was a real dream for me of having a specific goal to, to have something in that in progress section of double take. Uh, and then I was lucky enough to continue working there. And then I started to finally get some work, uh, assignment work that, that related to this practice, this observational practice. And then I, I loved the, you know, my favorite photo editor to work with was, was Elizabeth by far. And we worked with four photographers who did the opening picture uh, of the, um, of the, of the, the go, going on about time section. So, um, these were assigned by the New Yorker and thus very successfully did. And then it was up with ideas. 
this was something I was dying uh, as a native New Yorker and Yankee fan. I was dying to find a way to get onto the field, you know, before they tore the whole thing down. So originally I wanted to do something on umpires and that didn't work out. So then we got this idea to do something with the grounds crew. But I bring this up by way of saying the way that I worked with Elizabeth and so much of what I learned from her is, is first, you know, you're lucky when you get the assignment, but then there's a, a prolonged conversation about what that picture might look like. How could it fulfill the needs of whatever that story is that you are working on, whether it's as simple as the goings on about town to show an event that's happening in the city, um, or if it has a, a, a bigger, larger narrative social objective. So this, this thought of at once having some, some degree of a thesis statement and, and an initial pre-visualization of what you might wanna make, but then also being open to whatever can happen. And, and Elizabeth was wonderful about having that conversation before the shoot and even looking at, at, at pictures to talk about what could be done. And it's this type of process in an editorial world that can also be applied even to a personal practice. But it was never asking for a specific pictures. And I always describe it, it was, I give, there's the sandbox. Uh, I give the um, parameters of the sandbox and then the photographer goes, well, he might play, but works <laughs> mainly. And also in this section, it had to be one picture and it had to work large. So not a series of pictures, just one single image that had to work. Gus, you want to talk a little bit how we got to where we, what we're doing now? Yeah, so you know, we, when uh, Charlie originally reached out to us, it might have been uh, a month into quarantine to have some kind of conversation. And it really was about trying to find a way to work through the quarantine process. Um, and I had actually reached out to him because I had remembered the, the wonderful Here is New York exhibition that had happened in the past and the way that brought together the photo community in such a specific way and brought together images in such a specific way and also made this place. And it was such a cathartic um, moment for New York, but also for the photo community. And eventually it, it really had legs across the planet in terms of how people remember that experience. And I wondered if there was some way, I pined for there to be some way that, that we as photographers could do something that was like that now in 2020 around the quarantine moment specifically. And, and, and very much it felt like it's such a different time. The way photography is made, you know, there's more cameras than people, you know, at these demonstrations. Uh, you know, there's no longer a need to find someone to publish or disseminate the images. There's social media to make that happen. So the conversation began with thinking about, well, how could we talk about how to sort of navigate this moment as photographers and hopefully to, to stay kind of unstuck and alive and proactive. And this is even before getting into Black Lives Matter. So that was sort of the initial prompt. Yeah. yeah. So before I go backwards and compare uh, where, what we're living through right now, uh, I mean, they're truly extraordinary times. And um, so it started with the, uh, the virus where people had to go inside and um, the city changed, the place, everything changed really. And, um, and then next thing came the demonstrations uh, of Black Lives Matter. And again, the city is the background. And I think we're talking to most of the people here in, in, in New York, but not necessarily. So uh, we think, or I think it's an opportunity to do something uh, because not uh, every day uh, does something happen when we have the opportunity and the challenge to, um, to, to, to talk about it or to show pictures. So um, going backwards, I, um, I was thinking about um, when did something happen before? And of course, I came to 9-11. And um, the magazine, of course, did the entire issue on it in, in four days. You're full? OK. OK. Are we OK here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I wanted to show um, the pictures, uh, the photo essay that we published, and it was Gilles Perez, and he created an I mean, he created not he didn't just document a very he created very subjective portrait of a city in pain.
And to this date, I haven't seen anything uh, like it. Um, and so many pictures have been taken. So I, I caught him when he was running over the Brooklyn Bridge and then he started shooting. Hold it, hold it just a second. <laughs> um, so the next, um, uh, the next thing I was thinking about is um, the civil rights movement, the entire time, the civil rights, and it, it was, I think we can talk now, we can go now. Um, it was so incisive and the images, the images helped the movement to get people interested and think about it. And I put together some, pro some protests from that time as we're now dealing with protests of Black Lives Matter. Gus, can you go? Yes. Okay. Mm. All right, folks, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> we have a little preview. Getting there. So, um, and the way I put the pictures together, there's such different images, but they all way. I guess I think you can just go. They all addressed the protests. And while look at and them, looking at them, you sort of understand what went on at a certain time. And I think this can all be translated to now again. On a personal note, we see that not that much has actually changed. And Elizabeth, in terms of thinking about, you know, because this is kind of an opportunity too, just to think about your, your past as a photo editor working in so many different times as well, and, and having your choices between using archival material, assigning people to cover specific events, and then also looking at the present. How, how do you feel that that process has changed? Well, I mean, <laughs> when you think about it, at that time, magazines, you know, used many of the pictures and that sort of has disappeared. It hasn't disappeared, but, you know, it's far less. And um, on the other hand, um, uh, the internet has opened up um, a room to do to show your images. I mean, it's a lot more work, um, but it's definitely um, easier to show your work to and find its own audience. Um, of course, there are many, many more images floating around. Everyone can take pictures. And therefore, to me, it um, seems it's even more important that you find a very specific way of telling the story or transmitting an idea that you have and, um, and put this work together and edit it and then make it available to who is interested in seeing it. And I think we talk, we talk later about editing, but in general, I think there's much more freedom. But on the other hand, it's also much harder because you have to do all the work, you have to do everything. There are no more agents, there's not, you know, it used to be, 
it used to be kind of, there was this system how pictures um, got to uh, where they should go. So now it's greater freedom, but also more difficult. This is again where there, there's something about, uh, I had a, I'm gonna just show if, why I was so, I felt that, that the Here's New York show was so ahead of its time in, in many ways too, because Let's see if I can pull it. I keep closing the wrong one. I'm gonna get it up here again. We'll go back to there. But while you're looking at this, uh, while Gus is looking, to me, the amazing thing was that the protest of Black Lives Matter, which resonated more than ever before, is that I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick up after, after you, have, will you all look at this. So these were some ins installations of the Here's New York show. And, and to me, in, in revisiting these pictures and thinking about the show again, it felt like an image feed. It felt like it, re it relates to a degree to how uh, we respond to pictures. And often in our social media feeds, these pictures come in and you don't initially know who, who they're from and where they're from. And then there's this opportunity to, to to respond to them. And there was something up to, about here's New York, an analog version of how we are now. And it was this, this opportunity people give these pictures to the public. And it, and it really did sort of eliminate a lot of that, uh, the publisher and uh, photo editors, and it, and it let it arrive right to a public that was there on the sidewalk uh, on Spring Street. And it, it's true, it, it was like, we are looking at pictures now digitally. This was pre-digital and people could see the many views. And it was also democratic because everyone could submit their pictures. But going back to Black Lives Matters, um, when I saw that picture that we all saw of the officer doing the chokehold and I saw this photograph just it was, you know, it wasn't an, an it wasn't an extraordinary picture, but what it showed inspired an entire movement. It was this picture and then the video uh, that started everything. That is so important, and it's not a great photograph, but it transmits the cruelty that happened. And. Yes, do you want to show the, the, the you had, what you had, what you wanted to show? Uh, this was just another image. That my my first encounter with the with the video was a version of the video that had everything blacked out except for the cops, and that the fact that that was the and somehow that experience of seeing it that way in this version with these floating black boxes uh, had a really profound dramatic effect on me, and especially as sort of the things that followed, even with you know everyone doing those black squares on Instagram and on social media for that moment. And then in turn later, I'll show you some images of just the blackout squares that I've seen in the city. It, and again, I, I bring this up to think about where, where can you make a picture in this situation? Some of us are in the streets, some of us are in the country, some of us are with family, some of us are alone. There's so many different life situations that are happening right now. And I think everyone right at the, off the bat was experiencing quarantine in very different ways and navigating that. And I think photographers included. And now in this present moment as well. And you know, one thing that I think Elizabeth and I feel strongly about is that there is this real importance to keep making work of every kind. There's the, the simple fact of a lot of this, uh, uh, of what's happened is because of people having cameras and being able to disseminate them to an immediate public. And I think to go back to Elizabeth's point, you know, part of this initial discussion was talking about the relevancy of editorial photography. And what I think I've really been thinking about in the last few days is that I don't know that editorial photography is as relevant anymore, at least in terms of how it gets to people. Did you say it's not or is? I couldn't well, hear. Not. In terms of editorial meaning linked to a specific publication in some ways. I think it, so many of the things that are leading on the front line of image making are often outside of that and then are picked up afterwards by well, an example of news source. Yeah, but, but it, 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 it depends how you stay, uh, understand editorial photography. To me, when, when I hear editorial photography, it's not that... Um, 
it goes to a magazine. It is about what you want to say. There is a story, there is an idea that is being conveyed. And that to me is editorial uh, versus advertising or versus a conceptual photograph or, or a portrait. Um, editorial is anything that deals with the reality um, that is in the outside world. And I think that's also, you know, now we have a chance. Things, I mean, things are always going on, but right now, um, you know, things specifically going on. And it's very important to this country and to people uh, in this country. So um, on the one hand, um, I think it begs to make a statement and make pictures that say something. And I think at the same time, you know, it's also therapeutic, you know? Uh, I think if you have a project, if you're locked up in your room or if you go out with your mask and you, know, you, you can't do that many things, to have a project, um, I think is, 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 I think it helps and makes you feel like you're part of something, you're part of the world. Um, so I think it's very, I mean, I think it's very good that you think about it. And, and I'm not saying you have to go to demonstrations or anything. It, it could also be something in your room. In fact, I think one of the um, ICP grad students who was my, um, who was my um, intern for a while, his pictures were all in his room. That he put on it, and they were they spoke so much to what was going, what what was going on, and what he was feeling, and at the same time he helped himself um, when he did that and really showed the pictures. Have you, Matt? Have you have you done any pictures? Matt, uh, Matt sorry, Gus. <laughs> His name was Matt. Uh, Gus, have you, 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 I know you have done some pictures at the beginning. Do you want to maybe show them? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't preload. I did a, a big assignment that was actually very early in, in, in March. Uh, sort of the last proper editorial assignment I, I, I had was from around March 4th to a March 11th for Bloomberg, Bloomberg Business Week. And I was asked to run around the city and photograph uh, early signs of social distancing of which there were very few. Uh, and, and again, in trying to find a way to tell the story, the, the pictures that I ended up making the most were subway hands, because those, those actually, you looked at them and you saw all these different ways of, of holding things. But in the span of that one week when I was on the street photographing, I was, you know, I, I, I did the usual spots where there's lots of traffic, Herald Square. Um, I would wait at Herald Square and sometimes 40 minutes would go by before anybody had a mask on the first day. And then by the last day, the, the 10th or 11th, every three minutes, somebody would go by. So you saw this change. But when I was standing around shooting, I, it's funny, I had this, my, two, my head was going in two directions. One was to stick to the task at hand to try and make photographs that would describe social distancing and sell that story, because that's what I've been asked to do. But I also was craving to make pictures that looked as much like the city that I knew, that were busy and people rubbing shoulders and people completely not thinking about social distancing. Because I think I, in my heart of hearts, I knew that this was gonna be the last round of seeing this type of use of space. That afterwards, there would always be some kind of change. And, and so I ended up making both those types of pictures. That, you know, and I, I did a bunch of stuff with how people push doors and all these other things. What worked on the page best was a grid of all these different hands, you know, people holding the poles in different ways. And then after that, I, I, uh, I really ended up staying in Brooklyn. And I have a lot of work I've done. You know, my most recent book was called Family Car Trouble, which is a whole body of work that was just about my family. But it tried to really make a, a novel of the simplest, most inescapable parts of life, which is life and death and car trouble. And I actually gave a few talks when quarantine began because a lot of people were sort of stuck in their home, all of a sudden not out photographing the way they normally could, but having to, to deal with family life. And I, and I think that that prompt for me, that idea of, of trying to make something of whatever is in front of you, but trying it to have that deep intention of what you're feeling, your humanity, that's what's so essential. And I think that this is what's connected to this gift. And you know, all of you who've worked with great teachers and great editors and collaborated with, with people, you know that that elevates the work. 
But it's amazing how much work you can now put out without having that collaboration, except for the metric of it's liked or it's unliked. And yet, learning how to be your own assigner, to go back to these types of conversations I used to have with Elizabeth, you know, what, what could the picture look like? What's the story that we want to tell? Is it good news? Is it bad news? Is it a hardline statement or is it a question? Is it poetic or is it concrete? Putting all of those thoughts into yourself when you go out to make work, whether that's of your house plants, your children, your loaf of bread, people demonstrating, having this uh, check in with yourself to think about where you're at and how you're approaching the world that's in front of you and how you can make that be a part of the work is what's going to make the work successful and strong and stand out. And, but it's um, not oh, no, finish. Sorry, sorry. Uh, what what I want to add to this is, um, and, and, and you know, talking to Gus now, what I think is extraordinary about Gus's work, his um, his books and um, the assignments that he carried out. Um, I think I could guess if you show me four pictures in a row, I could guess they're Gus's pictures, and I don't have to have seen them before. I, I think in this day and age. Um, I, I think one has to be subject, subjective in the way one shows, one makes one's works and shows one's work. And um, looking at Gus's books, they're very kind of quirky, but they all are about him and about his photography. And, um, and as he managed before, I, I think also a, a um, humanity comes through, how he feels about people and how he, photo, how he treats people. Um, so in, in difficult times, I think that is even more important. On the other hand, you know, if you're a different kind of photographer, you just find a different subject and be true to the subject. Um, and uh, it's, 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 you know, it's easier said than done. But I, you know, I don't, in photojournalism in the 60s or 70s, when I was around, well, you, you, subjective photography was basically not acceptable. Except the Magnum photographers, they actually, you know, you knew a Philip Jones Griffiths versus, versus a Bruce Davidson, and they, they, they again, they saw the world in, in different ways. Um, but at magazines, we were told you have to be neutral, you cannot take a point of view. Um, and Geo Magazine, where I worked um, for, especially in the first two years, we did just the opposites. Our, our layouts, the photographs that we showed, were very much um, of a point of view visually. And we did these long photo essays. Uh, so, you know, I think maybe because I'm going back to that time, I very much believe in individuals, in an individual way of expressing yourself visually. Uh, you know, on that number, there's actually a, a couple of uh, Instagram accounts that I just wanted to sort of point us towards. Because um, these are just people who, who I feel like are, have, have each found ways to not only make singular pictures, but, but who I've been following. Again, this is this gift of we get to choose how we want to uh, experience these different places. You know, the same thing for me. That first time I saw the George Floyd video, it was with these black boxes. And then, and then uh, I happened to be in contact with somebody in, in, uh, in Minneapolis that, that night and ended up watching this unicorn riot live feed from the streets until four in the morning, you know, and this was just essentially citizen journalism happening. And I think that having these different opportunities and different um, Instagram feeds that are compelling and that have very specific voices. Let me just pull up, um, there's a couple that I wanted to share. Share screen. Um, desktop. This is Clay Benskin. He's a New Yorker. He splits his time between Yonkers and Tribeca. Uh, and he's, he's out there every single day making these pictures. And right from the beginning with uh, quarantine, uh, he was doing beautiful work. And actually, I think his, his family is all based in Yonkers. And they told him he had to stay uh, 
at sort of a crash pad that's where he works in Tribeca, but it afforded him this opportunity to keep photographing. And he has this balance of really bearing witness both to the hard parts of the story and the beauty. And you go through it and he's, you know, there's still things that one could call sort of the schmaltzy, beautiful backlit moment of people swimming and navigating this and then everything else. And it's just, for me, it's been a really wonderful uh, set of pictures to be following. And um, it's really informed me about what's been happening in my native city. Cause as I've been out of town, it's something that I've really missed. Another, and that's Clay, Clay Bankins, Benskin. Another one that is much more in a traditional photojournalistic model, but still very much has a very strong point of view in terms of aesthetics and how, and how his work manifest is Mark Peterson, who's been making pictures for just about every publication as well as uh, for his own feed. High contrast, very present. Uh, he's been doing great political work for the really the past decade, if not longer. But another one of these photographers who's really been boots on the ground, present for so much of this, starting with quarantine and then going into Black Lives Matter. Yeah, he has been there for any and every crisis that went, went on. I think the difference now is the pictures because you can digitally enhance them a little bit. They're crisper than they, they used to be. Yep. I also, I do find it really interesting to see how much of the coverage that is being both published and also even people that are, are posting on Instagram and social media is being done in black and white. And I think there's still this kind of, it's part of the language. One, it, it makes for a picture that's more graphic and it doesn't have all those messy colors of whatever the wardrobe is. Um, but I do think it somehow links to those pictures that Elizabeth showed earlier and that that sort of psychological aesthetic connection is one that that is real in terms of how people think about these pictures and what their purpose is. True, the um, COVID uh, uh, reportages that I've seen in, in publications were all black and white, each yeah. single, each single one. And um, well, I think, I think this day and age, I don't really care whether it's color or black and white. Uh, and I also don't mind mixing color and black and white. And, um, but there's something kind of making more, making more serious when it's black and white. And black and white abstracts, so it, it's sort of easier to take in fast, I think. And then the last person I wanted to share is, is Tim Davis, uh, who's a great photographer, formerly a poet. He's recently been posting a whole set of pictures that I don't even know if they've been made recently. Sometimes he's posting other people's work, but he's also linking them uh, with a piece of poetry that he writes. And he's, he has a long-term project on uh, called the, Upst I think it's the Upstate Event Horizon. So a lot of these pictures have been made upstate. Um, but it's somebody, each, each, each of these artists, for me, has a very strong point of view and a strong aesthetic. Um, and they're each kind of working in different terrain. You know, Clay is in New York, looking at New York. Uh, Tim is upstate, but sometimes showing us pictures from, from farther afield, but linking them with poetry. And then Mark is very much, it's, it's the work of a, of a proper photojournalist, doing his best to get close in that kind of Robert Kappa model. Uh, and to tell that story and deliver something that's high contrast, both literally, but I think also in terms of the communication value as well. So those were just three voices that I kind of wanted to put forward that I've been paying attention to that have um, been places that I've, I've returned to repeatedly. And then, but I, I want to pivot back to talking about making personal projects. One of the things, and again, going all the way back to something that when Elizabeth and I first had this conversation about doing a talk, you know, the group of photographers that I work with in, in my commercial agency, when everything went quiet, we started having a weekly Zoom meeting. And then eventually we decided we wanted to do, do something. So we actually ended up creating a zine together. And I'm someone who traditionally has hated the word zine. It just seems like it's a diminutive thing that, that often is an excuse for not doing something particularly well. But there was something about this idea of, of working in that way now, lowering the stakes, but saying it was imperative that we make something, that we get something out, that we take whatever it is that we have 
pointed our camera at or whatever it is that we've wrestled with and try to turn it into something and let it be completed. And you can hold it in your hand, right? And you but. can hold it in your hand because we made it, we, we did a PDF version and then we made a physical thing, but it, it, it was meant to sort of really embrace um, something that can be completed. And you know, the thing about working in social media is that you could just stick one picture up and somehow that is successful to a degree, but it, it's not enough. There has to be this more prolonged effort to communicate, to have an idea of what you're trying to say, and then to make a series of decisions to attempt to reach that point, and then finding a way to wrap it up, even if it fails. Um, you know, we were trying to see if we could do some kind of an online workshop thing where we even try and make a thing, but I bring this up to say that really think about trying to complete things. Setting small deadlines, even a timer of 20 minutes. Look at the pictures that you've just made from the last three week, weeks. Think about where you're at with yourself and find a way to just take one little piece of language and find a way to turn that into something and then dropping it in the mail to someone. These acts of, of completion, of creation, even if they fail, they're what is gonna get you through this. And also I just feel, you know, one of the big things I, I, I feel so strongly about as a photographer, as my job of going out in the world and, and pressing that button, that's the part of this life that I love the best. Every time I press that button, I feel like it's an act of saying yes to something uh, that's in front of me. It's this effort to have a dialogue with both it and myself simultaneously and to try and find a way to communicate something. Uh, I, I just picking up something in my, um, next to my desk. Um, my intern, Amina Gingold, can you see that? Uh, she just sent me her zine and uh, thanking me for working with her and her working with me. And it's just, it's just, it's, it's wonderful to, you know, have this as a, as a memory, as something that I can look at and hold and look at it next week or maybe in a year. So uh, it's as close, I guess, as, as, as editorial magazine photography um, that, uh, that now everyone can do if you want to do it. Elizabeth, should we talk, we had this conversation too about the pendulum of, you know, conceptual to concrete work. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> um, that is, you know, uh, uh, Charles, Charles Straub says every, every, every photography, every um, story is conceptual, that you have a concept, uh, yes, and that's, you know, it's just one way of saying it, but uh, I, you know, I always tried to explain what kind of photography I believed in or what, what kind of photography there is. So I have like a timeline and it goes from the most concrete to the most abstract. So to me, the most radically concrete is photojournalistic photographer. F photography, someone goes somewhere, someone takes pictures, doesn't change anything, doesn't rearrange anything. We had, I mean, in the 60s, when I believe it, 70s, we, did, we, you know, we had a discussion. If you could, you know, move the person 20 feet away or not, because it was a better, better background. I mean, now that seems all ludicrous, but it was so strict. Um, so then, um, then came, then next on, the, on, that, on that line came for me, documentary photography. Uh, documentary photography to me is more personal. Um, and it, uh, it's, it, 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 you, you don't, you know, you can basically set something up or as long as the truth, as long it is concrete and it's there, it's fine. And um, I think it's also, um, I think I talked about that before, it's very subjective. And, um, and then to me, um, the, uh, the next um, part uh, is um, abstraction, where you, um, where you basically use your own voice or your own photography, and you don't have to be in a room to take a picture of something. You can, uh, you can use anything um, that you want, or you can express it any, any which way. And the final one to me is conceptual photography in the sense uh, often you don't even see anymore that it's photography. Uh, it's it's a, a structure or something. And all of this is a 
acceptable and all of this um, coexists. Um, and so to me, kind of, I put, you know, when I look at pictures, I put them in, in these two, in these different, um, uh, different boxes. Um, Gus, what do you think of that? I agree with that. Um, the thought that jumps to my head is for those of us who are trying to wear the hat of being lens-based artists, where is the interesting work to be done? Uh, and where is there the, the most space to push yourself? And, and for me, it, it, it's, it is an ongoing, especially, you know, as someone who, you know, all this language is, you know, it's, is it straight photography? Is it humanistic photography? I know all of my photography has a relationship to the real world. It's not just about my ideas, right? It's, it's a response. It's out there. And I think the types of photography that we're trying to speak about here in this moment in time is about that. But I kind of feel like more than ever, the job of, of if we think of every photograph that being linked to a specific time and place, the burden of that job, which is very concrete, is, is you don't have to worry about that anymore. There's so, so many other ways that that's being done uh, through phones, through th that photography, that sort of front line of time and space, I think is kind of being done. So for me, that to, to find a way to still have a relationship to the facts as you perceive them as ha at hand and how you understand yourself and to try to make work that for me has a relationship to, to poetic truths at the same time. You know, this is again, something that I felt like I tried to do with this, this, you know, th this book I did family cultural, it's about, you know, a dying dad essentially, you know, and yet to find a way to make it somehow be accessible so that it feels like a lived experience that many have had as opposed to just being a downer. And I think this opportunity to try and look really hard at this present, which is quite difficult and with vulnerability and to try to make work that balances your skin in the game with the perception of what it actually is. So. Yes, you're still bound to the here and now. And I think those four steps that I, um, I said, you know, they get less and less connected to the here and now and uh, become at a certain point totally cerebral. And I just did the ICP um, uh, portfolio review and uh, the, last, um, the last person was a um, you know, Chinese woman and she had done a little, a tiny, tiny little installation. And uh, the installation was um, a, um, a cosmetic surgery hospital for pigs and and it was just i mean it was absolutely amazing of course you know you know i mean 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago what you know this is not photography what does it have to do with this you know and uh, but it has such a fertile imagination and and i mean i almost had to had to laugh but that is still in the realm of photography these days so there's greater freedom and I think photographers can choose what they you know what they believe in and what they want to do and we the people who look at photography and work with photography but are not photographers you know we accept all of them we have personal uh, preferences but we accept all of them these days so um, you know I think there's something good in it um, but you know, and this, where we are now, we have the here and now, and we can go outside and see things and report on things in, 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 in our own, in our own way. I mean, the pictures that I've seen of the, um, during the COVID-19, which is still ongoing, um, the ones that I've seen published were all black and white. So it came like the strong traditional photography, um, uh, uh, was shown mainly and, um, and, and, but in the Black Lives Matters, of course, also, you know, the protest pictures link back to how protest pictures were done, but they don't have to. They can be totally abstracted and be good. You're looking very serious, Gus. I'm so sorry. 
but yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but you know it's just like again I've seen back, a lot of serious pictures in my head yeah, you know yeah and, and i'm thinking and honestly i feel it in my to be perfectly honest i feel it in my stomach too you know because that's the thing this is the uh and like i said this is something i've struggled with myself in this time to feel uh going all the way back. I remember when I first wrote Charlie about just feeling, you know, how, how can we find something that did that thing that Here's New York did? Wanting this, uh, this, this, this feeling of a community and wanting to find a way that us as image makers can contribute to this moment. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't have, the, I don't have a one line answer, except that we have to keep making work. Because I yes. do, feel, especially those of us who really think about this stuff deeply, we're the ones who are going to be able to contribute our humanity as we bear witness to humanity. And more than ever, I think we're learning to be more vulnerable, more self-aware. Uh, and I do think exploring, you know, using these, our visual languages to, to participate in that is essential. Even if it's just with ourselves, that level of self-reflection through this time is going to get us to the next place. And I also just feel in terms of, you know, it's our humanity that, that has to be protected, that can't be replaced by the algorithm. That I think, you know, and like I say for me, every time I, I pick up a camera and I get that tingle, whether I'm trying to take a picture of a, you know, a dust bunny in the house or somebody running across the street, that it, for me it is this affirming act to say that I believe in life and I believe in everything that's happening out there and trying to meet it in the present. And, you know, I, when I finally, uh, you know, I, I, I have, you know, I've been sort of in quarantine with my family out of the city. And when I finally got back into the city, I made it into the city on the first day that everything was opened up again in Manhattan, which was the eighth. I'm just going to share some of this. And, and I, and it was this thing, you know, I'm going to street corners that I've photographed on so many times. Um, and I'm trying, and I know I'm just going to be in town for this one day. And I'm trying to see, is there a way that I can, make something here just in this time and space and i got completely uh you know again i was thinking back to that that screen grab i showed you of the george floyd video that had the blacked out boxes i was thinking about the black boxes everybody stuck up on social media and then going through you know walking from 57th street down fifth all the way into soho and seeing again i don't know who makes these decisions but somebody decided to very carefully black out paint what i assume was other graffiti and for me, they became these really profound boxes. And again, I'm not saying these are amazing pictures, but this is out of me going out and saying, this is it, this is all I have to work with. How can I find something that, that speaks to me and that somehow is communicating this moment for me? And I felt like images of this covered graffiti to me were way more powerful than if I actually was reading the graffiti itself. And I don't know if I'm gonna do anything with these. I, I, again, in, in terms of you know me, uh, suggesting that everybody try and make something. I'm considering trying to make something with this that would be, it could be back and forth between these images with screen grabs from uh, that black box George Floyd video. It could just be these things on their own, but th these messages that have been put, and somehow to me, each one became uh, a human being behind there. And it just, it, I mean, it, it was a really powerful for, thing for me to walk through the streets and discover these things. And like I said, I don't know if this is gonna become something. I'm gonna turn it into something, but it, this is this act of me trying to make the most of these empty streets on that one day when I was there. So I, I wanted to share some of those. Again, as a prompt to say, put some lines in the sand, set a deadline, and just turn it into something as best as it can be, and then complete it and go to the next thing. I think it's a, it's, it's a great concept and it might grow somewhere else or, or, or not, but I think it's, it's a really wonderful idea that you have come up with in one day coming back to New York and um, and followed it through. And I was just sort of thinking also, you know, you do a lot of um, family pictures, which are wonderful. But then I remembered Eleanor Carucci, she did, you know, her, her, her family. And, um, uh, and, and it was very touching. So it was very touching to see and, um, uh, I kind of, you know, thought about myself. I have my dog, you know, so, uh, but it, it, it helped me. Um, so it was wonderful to see. And, and it was also, there was a lot of pain in there too. So, um, uh, and she posted the pictures and it is on Instagram. Yeah, uh, it was a, uh, that, that, that was really quite, quite, quite touching. Um, but Gus, back to your, to your, 
to your uh, book, Family Car Trouble. Um, I mean, all his books are, are, I would call original because they're, it's an original way of looking at things. Um, and in Car Trouble as well, and he mixed um, pictures. His father had, father had died recently and um, he uh, used pictures of his father and then uh, he had this, he has family car trouble. Uh, and I think we're gonna look at it. Um, so maybe I shouldn't just talk about it, but then, you know, so it became a family narrative, so. I'll just slide through some of it. Uh, it's the, the book is the size of a novel. Again, this is this sort of idea of taking advantage of an existing form that has rules. So it's, it's really like a trade hardcover novel um, with the flap with quotes and all of that from several people here right now. And it's meant to be a bit of a sonic experience too. The sound of my father on one side of the page getting dimmer, the sound of my kids getting more active. And then it's about control. I can't con really control my father's health or my kids, but I can keep throwing money at this car and attempting to keep it on the road and moving. And thinking about lenticulars, you know, with this sort of use of repetition, having the little flutters of moments of, mov of movement. And all of it really made in the in-between moments of family life. You know, none of these are really high moments. The highest moments are probably when the car is being towed. <laughs> Everything else is kind of interstitial and, uh, This is the tick tock. I was thinking about that wonderful Felix Gonzalez Torres piece of the two clocks side by side, the lovers, and that difficult notion of how can you get you know two souls to be in sync that way, and 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 for some reason seeing this tick tock of the swings has done that for me. And the car kind of rising to the occasion at the end in terms of sort of getting its act together and taking us forward. So that's... I really like the pacing of the book. Um, the way you did individual images and then you put pictures together that made a new whole or did double pages and it's never boring. It just, it just moves and it moves and it's moving. It's just, you know, I love this book. I, I just really love it. So. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth, Elizabeth did yeah. you want to show, there were some other pictures you wanted to show as well. Did you want to Yeah, yeah I thought that's what I, uh, what, what, so coming back to the time we live in, um, and I've seen these pictures, I saw them on, on, on Instagram, and I said, oh, who is this person who does these pictures? And then I looked, and it's someone you all know, and he's up there looking. <laughs> Hi, Charles. Um, so, no, that's the back. Oh, sorry. Okay, all right. I got to hear the voice of Elizabeth from when I worked under her at the office. That was, yeah, the one who made a mistake at the New Yorker in around uh, 2001. Um, what do you mean? Getting excited? <laughs> okay. So, um, I think it's also, it, it, this is a, a perfect example I think you can just stroll through. I won't say anything to every 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 picture, 
Citrona assembly, the, the, yes, there's an overall subject matter, which is here and now. And then there are pictures that are found, but they have, all of them have a particular vision. And I think you can go with, uh, yeah. They all have, you know, they, there's a cohesive vision in those pictures. And um, there, it, it is both, it is both cohesive, but also not boring. It, there are also very different kinds of pictures that are put together. Uh, like this one is very bold, it's very simple, it's very bold. And looking at those images, kind of, yes, this is how I feel right now. This is what I see right now. Um, and I think it's very, and then, you know, at the end, hope. You know, is there any picture that is more than this? talks about hope. Um, so I, I thought it was quite an extraordinary series and I think they will probably continue. Charles, do you want to say something? Uh, thank you for... Oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. <laughs> um, they reflect all the emotion, all the insight stinks and all the background that I know very eloquently expressed by both of you is the need to make pictures and figure out what to do with them. Uh, like I, I, you noted earlier, uh, I don't believe in the idea that there's something called conceptual photography and then something else. Every good photographer works on ideas that become, have a concept in them. Uh, it may not be in the forefront until work gets made and uh, comes out of the previous concept or out of one's knowledge history and frankly, as Gus said, their humanity and their desire to find something to say. Uh, at this moment, you know, we all have many things to say and we don't really know how what we have to say is going to affect the political powers to be, uh, except that if we don't say it, then we're allowing them to rule in this demonic way. And photographs have a great deal to say. I don't know that one photograph is worth a thousand words, as I've said over and over again, but as witnessed in the Here's New York that Gus has so beautifully referred to, when we put it together, we had this notion that a lot of pictures could mean something. A thousand pictures does tell us something real. So now we have the ability to make thousands and thousands of biz pictures, all of us who are serious about pictures, but even, even those who just need to make a witness to what they experienced or their record for their memory. The big question is putting them together in meaningful structural ways, which cr calls for what I call an interlocutor, a creative interlocutor, for a new kind of editor, picture maker, director, conductor, whatever, to get that work out to those who aren't converted to our way of thinking. So that's the mission, I think, for the younger, technologically adept generation to start thinking about. That's all I can say. I like making yeah. pictures and it's a way, it's an escape. And it's also a way to remind me, this is really real right now. I also think pictures can do something. Pictures have consequences. And um, we live, you know, we know we live in difficult times, but we also live in um, politically different, difficult times. And maybe it's the time of change, at least I hope it's the time of change. And I think to be part of that conversation, um, I think is really important. And um, we, we, I think not everybody can contribute, but those who can, I think should. And, um, as you know, as we seen earlier pictures in, from the 60s and the civil rights movement, pictures were so important. You know, there's the lunch counter image, and it's still in our in our in our heads. 
and they made some kind of they moved you know they moved the 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 the, the barrier a little bit uh, and I think we are now again in 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 in, in extraordinary times and um, I just hope I see a lot of pictures or I see images out there that express um, express a political Politically, politically express themselves. Of course, I hope in one direction, but it doesn't have to be. You know, it's it's not everyone thinks the same. Absolutely agree. Uh, and this thing, this phone, allows everybody and anybody to make a statement, uh, other than just the picture of me or my family or whatever, uh, or, but to put it into a new worldly context. And it's. Pretty adept. You know, I was a, a comparative religion major in college. I don't know how that happened, but that's what happened. Um, I think the studio art classes, everybody looked like a studio artist, but it wasn't as uh, creative, whereas the religion classes got pretty creative, and that was compelling to me. And one of the things that I remember just thinking about is just this idea of, you know, the mitzvah of doing these little acts that will lead towards bringing on something better. And, you know, I just, I think that this act of trying to listen to yourself and trying to look at the world thoughtfully and, uh, and to be, you know, basically, I, you know, I wanna make an argument that every time you make a picture, you're making a little mitzvah of some kind. <laughs> and to be aware of what you're doing with these pictures too, because also you can be doing negative things with pictures too. As we know, there's a lot of pictures that are harming things. So it's twofold to one, really embrace this act of making the work. And then two, to do the self work as well, to address what, we don't, what am I putting into this picture? How am I uh, contributing both to my own evolution and to the, and to what's happening in front of me. And I, you know, there's a wonderful, uh, street photographer named Daniel Arnold, who some of you may know, who's, who's, who's out there constantly making photographs. And he, you know, I, I, it didn't come directly to me, it was translated to somebody else, but, but he was, this was really more in quarantine that he talked about the act of going out and, and taking these pictures on the street and not even posting them, but the act of taking these pictures and just paying attention was like he was at the, the bedside of his sick friend, the city <laughs> itself. And I think we all need to find our ways to nurture and evolve. And I do think that photography and a photographic practice of paying attention deeply and trying to do uh, lens-based art and communication, it contributes. And I think it's just to, to really stay true to that. I don't, Eleanor, I don't know if you're up for speaking at all, but I, you know, I feel like you have a lot of skin in this game too. And it's been so wonderful to see, you know, the work that Elizabeth referenced too, that, that has been out there and knowing that, you know, you very much have had a way of talking about the present through the way you and your family have navigated that. And, and I don't know if, if you're up for, for. Yeah, I was thinking too, if, uh, to ask Eleanor if she wants to contribute something. Is she still there? Um, yes, she is. Yes, 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 <laughs> no, I mean, you said such smart things and um, I don't know if I, I can talk, but I feel that this, this work for me was done um, without thinking beforehand. It was just like very immediate, very intuitive. Um, I just looked at the first photograph that I made and it was March 14th. And I think it was... Um, Many times I make work in order to say something, and this was, I made work in order to understand what's going on around me. And the posting also was different because I've, I'm usually working on projects for years and years before I even show them to my gallery, not to mention posting. But I had the need to post and people, po you know, posted and wrote back to me and shared things and maybe it was desolation so it became instagram really became the the avenue that i was working for i was looking forward to posting and I, i'm usually i'm not doing it so um it was a way to communicate with the world and i'm just now because the work might be published and exhibited i'm sitting now to write about it and i it's it's very different than you know midlife thinking about what it is to be middle age and feminism I just took pictures as they happen and posted them. Posting forced me to write something. 
And so I wrote as I go, but it was a different way of working and therapeutic in, in a way. And they were instinctual, right? They were instinct-based, right? right? Right, very much so. And and also, <laughs> this is funny, usually my kids, I've been photographing my kids teen years and they're usually mom and they don't want to be photographed. But a new maturity happened or they were with me more, they're less distracted and they never said no. I mean, they always, they really helped me with making the work. Um, so it became also kind of healing in a way. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's it. You could also, I mean, you could also think of this time as a gift, as a gift to kind of look at what you might want to do and use with this time. I mean, I started writing, which is like I'm not a writer, but yes, you it, are. Elizabeth. No, no, no. I mean, you know, but you know, it. I, I got. I was very when I was out there in South Harbor. I was very. I started getting very anxious and upset, and then I sort of blocked off two hours every day and I did and it made me very happy you know it made me I didn't even think you know I didn't I mean I knew what I wanted to accomplish but it, it's, it's open-ended so it, it I, I really feel it is um, partially a therapy and um, right. it's not right. neutral you know it's, it's just uh, yeah it just really helps but I remember you know like I, I sort of flipped through Instagram and then I saw the yeah, pictures and, uh, and, and, you know, I could really, there, there were, there were emotions in there, you know, instinctual and emotional. So. Yeah, all of my emotions were in there because yeah, they right, had right, nowhere right, else right, to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Eleanor, I think there's one thing that, that really stood out in what you said is just the sense of urgency. Right, because so often, you know, I too have spent many, many years before I put a project forward often, you know, to a fault, you know, I focus group it and do 15 versions and this only to go back to the beginning, whatever. But this sense of urgency in, the, in this moment and also because it's been changing so fast and then doesn't change and then does change. And then, so that kind of working with this strange, strange time, there, there is, uh, there's something about the sense of urgency that I think can be quite liberating. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't let you hold back because it's just this, this is where it is right now today. And it's going to be different in 42 hours, you know? Right. Um, I mean, it's liberating, but it's also some kind of desperation and hopelessness because I was like, am I going to plan for a project and a book? No, because I might die. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, um, it was liberating, but also like, fuck that. I'm not thinking about a book or a project or the strategy. This is what I do right now and we have today. And so there was urgency, but also um, uncertainty of, of the future and of planning or thinking in, in the usual terms of project. It was just today's today and this is it. And, and liberating, but scary as well, as you're saying. And then sort of in the olden times, you know, in the in these 80s, 90s, um, you know, you had to buy film, you know, you did all these things, had to print it, had to do it. Now you can just take the picture, you know, uh, and, 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 and you're free to do what you want to do. You didn't have these barriers from, from other times. And I also want to say, like, I remember Gus early on didn't say taking pictures, he said making pictures. I remember sort of like 20 years ago, he said, making pictures and there's something very to me uh, it is such a good way of expressing what has happened when you do pictures consciously it, you're making it you know you're, you're putting something in it so uh, I always I always and you use the word as well you know so I, I actually one of my pet peeves is when people you know and I, I used to in, in, in the office I used to say you can't, this word is verboten when people called at their work stuff, stuff, stuff. He said, no, no, st I mean, sort of, you know, these words do mean something. And so making a picture is almost like a craft and hopefully an inspired craft. I always say that cameras take pictures, I make pictures. Good, very good. There's um, another thing that just came to mind too in talking about this idea of urgency too and, and, and it came up when Elizabeth and I were talking a little bit yesterday, you know this bananas thing of everybody making sourdough bread, of everybody doing this type of cooking things that, that they've never done before. That 
need to do that is also can be linked to these creative acts of photography. But you have to see it all the way through. You got to actually like knead the dough, bake the thing, stick it in the oven, and then see if it's lousy or good. And I just think I bring it up really to, again, to say that lower the bar on some of the expectations in order just to keep trying. You know, try to, try to make the loaf of photo bread and see what it might be. And it might not work out today, but it might work out better the next time. And you toss it, and then if it's really good, then you share it with friends. But you have right. to go the distance with it. And I think allowing for uh, that little bit of play and that lower bar and thinking of it as a nurturing act, right? Because everybody's not making this bread just because they want carbs. It's, they're participating in some ancient ritual. And that's what we do as visual storytellers too. So it's making it be a ritual, make it being something that, that's manageable and actionable and that you can actually complete. Gosh, I think, I think you said the, the, the magic word to share it. That loaf of bread is, is very important. And we have such powerful means of sharing it, which is not to say that in sharing it, we're not going to get feedback back, some negative and some anti whatever we're doing. But I, I think we need to uh, take, acknowledge that ability to share and to get it out there in a way without being self-aggrandizing or overly, you know, here's the greatest picture in the world, but it is something that has something to say about a given moment and a given time that seems suspended and delirious. And, uh, uh, but in fact, it's quite democratic. All of us seem to be experiencing it uh, in, in more or less the same horrific ways. And, and the great doubt that we all share, uh, but the pictures are, are the evidence of our being here with it fighting it, consoling ourselves, and uh, perhaps suggesting uh, the metaphors for hope in it. So, Just, it's, it's uh, going sharing, back. sharing makes a difference at this moment, being able to share. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. But I wanted to go back to here's New York. Um, so ICP is soliciting, soliciting, soliciting uh, images. Uh, and it's been it's been going on for a while, and I'm very curious what they do with it because there must be thousands of images by now. So I will, you know, we'll we'll see what they do if if it's more than uh, an exhibition on the wall. Um, so I have no idea what where where they're going, but it'll be it'll be interesting. What do you think? Of, should we see if there's any specific questions to? Because we have yes, some. because then I also wanted to be a little um, talk a little bit about editing and sequencing, which is sort of concrete. Um, but let's ask questions first. Ask for questions first, if there are any. Yeah, I I have a question, um, <clears throat> and this has come up with um, some conversations with students over the past couple months. And it's sort of about like what happens if you don't make socially engaged work and we're living in a time when everything is so socially engaged. I think students feel a pressure to put that into their work to give it like if their work doesn't have it, it has no value at this point in time. And I think that's a, it's a pressure, a very real pressure that people can feel. But it was kind of nice seeing Gus to be able to talk about socially engaged work, but also see the personal side of um, family car trouble, which was made, I mean, no, it was made before and over a period of time, but sort of, I guess just kind of, I wanted to introduce the topic of what, how do you make work? <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm trying course, to. But I think all is a response, you know, so if you go, and you, you do these pristine um, landscapes or pictures of trees. I mean, there's, it, it's, you know, it's, it could be spiritual. Um, even if, if anyone can make me laugh, you know, that's the response. And, you know, and, and, and there are way too few pictures in the world that make me laugh or make me smile a little bit. So I think, you know, and you can use that by giving it a title, you know, that refers to what you wanted to do. So. I think it isn't it isn't narrowly defined to just you know pictures of demonstrations or, or sick people or you know and and of family of course family you know, sort of in these times you know those who are closest to you 
you know, they're there and they're human beings. So they, you know, so that, that, that is easily a subject, but it can be, it can be still life. It can be a series of still lives. It can be so many different things, but I'm quite sure students think about that and say, well, I don't want to do this. You know, I'm, I'm not that kind of photographer. I want to do something different. And I, I think it's, it's, it's wide, it's wide open. I agree with what Elizabeth said too. And I think, you know, I talked about some of this before too, but for me, it's, you know, I, first of all, for myself, I've never identified as a photojournalist in any capacity. You know, it's, I, I, it's usually when I go to do a job and the subject that I'm photographing asks me, how long have you been a photojournalist? And it kind of it confuses me. It's not something that I think about in terms of how I work, that it's my job to uh, act as a journalist with a camera. I think it's my job to try and be there to, to meet that present and that person and it's contractor work. So to fulfill the needs of that given client in that space. When you're trying to make work for yourself, which is in essence what we're talking about. And of course, who doesn't want to be making work that's of the present and that is somehow engaged in this moment in time. And then who, you know, and then the ambition to, to want to make work that might actually, uh, have a social consequence. I mean, it's incredibly ambitious <laughs> to think that you can actually do that. And I think if you look back at the work that often had, you know, real, real social impact, it, it might not be the, the work that you think it had that in its thesis statement. So you have to make the work that belongs to you. And I also think you have to complete it, whatever it is. And you have to be honest to your intentions. I mean, I think that's the big thing, you know, go, don't just if you're pivoting away from the, the, the parts that are frightening you to look at something with beauty, then really think about that and have that be a part of it. You know, you can't hide it. You can hide in either direction. You can hide by trying to make lousy work of protests, or you can hide by making lousy pictures of your kids and your, and your bread and sunsets. So it's really about being honest and trying to reflect who you are, where you're at, and then being brave enough to turn it into something and then let's make share be the mantra, because that's the thing. We can all make these pictures and, and keep them in our phones and in our pockets, but until there's an audience, what is that? That's your journal. Now, again, with social media, everybody has an audience that they don't know, but you have to think about what you're trying to transmit, you know? And at least, first of all, you have to make it for yourself. But, you, you know, I, I'm looking at this present and imagining if, if it was 25 years ago, I would be out on the street looks like mad making pictures. That's just not where I am. And it's, it makes me lose sleep at certain times because I'm trying to figure out how to navigate this and how to, 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 to make the pictures that I can make that, that meet me where I am and that help hopefully teach me how to rise to this present and contribute to it in some capacity. So if it's blacked out rectangles on, on plywood, that's what it is for now. That's, that's what I could commit to in that moment. Do I think it's profound? No, but that's what it was. So it's really just, you know, you can't force that stuff. You know, some people are gonna be, you know, that's their, their path. But I do think if you're feeling that to try to have whatever project you do, speak to that in some capacity. And it can be a still life and it could be a pet photograph and it could be, the, it could be any of that, but think about it. And that might be about using language, you know. It might be about using time in a specific capacity. You know, I, I've been thinking so much about this passage of time, you know, this eight plus minutes that this man was, was held down and that has now manifested in space in different ways at demonstrations of people being quiet. And I was like, well, what, you know, that's a time left. That's a, what about a time exposure project that's just that, that incorporates that? You know, I don't know what, and I haven't done anything with it, but I'm just saying there's so many ways to embrace time and space and to think about lifting something from the present and turning it into something else. So it's being creative, you know, and not thinking that it has to look like social work to be social work. It doesn't have to look like a protest picture. I mean, that's why I think it's so interesting. All this stuff is in black and white because it kind of, oh yeah, I know what that looks. It could be anything in black and white at this point on my phone and I'm gonna think it's a protest before it's anything else. So- I can just add, it doesn't have to look like art to be art or it may say it's art and not be art. Okay. So I mean, it has to come from sincere intentions to be, a really socially aware, maybe not in the uh, activist way or in the uh, political way, but all artists has to be socialists, socially, socialists, socially aware. I mean, it, it, it has to express that inner awareness of man's relation to other people. 
to men, to women, to, to the world, to, to history. <laughs> Uh, or, no, I think there are no or, limits to it, but it has to be, and, and it has to be genuine. It has to be genuine. coming from you, and that makes it, you know, original is one thing, but it's also that it's, it's genuine. Express yourself with your pictures, with your images, and uh, try not to become an actor who is talking in a different language. Um, I mean, I, yeah, uh, right. sorry. In the arts, is an age-old question. I, th I think people who are lens-based feel a pressure to be there in the world. But if you talk to, let's say, painters over the decades, every painter I know who you might call political flees from the concept of being political because they're used to having to sublimate uh, in total denial that this is political. Um, so it just comes back to you know this idea of redirection, I suppose, or sublimation. But I know. I'm feeling guilty. Um, I'm an old guy, I have asthma. I've been politically active for decades and here I am sitting on my ass in my apartment. Um, and I feel like I should be directing some energies towards that particular moment. But I'm writing about something that has no relationship whatsoever to that. And it's some of the best writing I've ever done. And I, <laughs> I go, where did that come from? And I can only guess that this because of that, that pressure, that blowback, is you need to be creative and you feel it and somehow that expresses it. It's this wonderful concept about the zeitgeist, how ideas permeate a particular time and how then it comes out in so many different directions. I completely agree. Thank yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just gonna change the conversation a little bit and tell a sort of a funny story. No, well, uh, so, you know, the, the thing, and again, going back to um, Gus, um, the way he tells his story, they're always very genteel, and they are, you know, they're, they have a little bit of humor to them, and um, and I, I think, uh, so the, the pictures that he is making, um, some of them are an assignment, and he gets hired for his um, expertise. And I was walking uh, down um, uh, Hudson Street and a taxi crosses on Chambers and Gus says, hey, Elizabeth, I'm going, I'm going to uh, have a shoot. Uh, wish me luck. And <laughs> so, I mean, but, but what it was, actually, he was hired. Uh, but was it an agency that hired you, advertising agency? It was uh, Nordstrom's, it was the brand. So he was, he, he was doing, you know, Nordstrom used his way of seeing things to advertise, you know, to advertise and hopefully paid him nice money, you know. So, um, so even when it, is, when it is for an assignment, he, is, he does what he does so well. And I greatly, you know, I, I, I believe in this. I believe in this so much. And then there's another photographer, actually, you know, Martin Schiller, who, you know, he said, well, advertising work, fine. Just, you know, just, I do it. I get a layout. I do it. I'm a professional. But when I do my own pictures, I do it my way. But this, I just get hired. This is my job. You know, so, I mean, there are always two different ways of going about, about things. Um, but I like the consistency of your voice, Gus. And they're you. It's like you. It reflects you. <laughs> so I'm grateful for, uh, for that, that uh, Okay, so shall we maybe actually move on and, and sort of talk a little bit? Um, uh, let's say you've done, you know, you have a project, you have, you know, you have a, either a story or you have an idea, and you've done, um, you've done 30, 40, 50, you have a lot of images now, and you don't want it, you don't just want to put it uh, on Instagram one by one, um, but you want to show it as, as in, in, a, in, a, in a visual narration. And um, I think it, when you do this, and when you start doing this, you, you should be clear in your mind what you're actually doing. And, or what actually is this that I'm going to now share with the world. Um, and I think the best way 
to be clear about this and to do this before you start editing and refining what you have is to write a short statement. Because if you write a short statement, you can't bullshit. You know, you have to get your, you know, by, by writing, it has to be clear. It has to go from beginning to end. And I think writing um, makes it, helps you um, to clearly define what you're doing now. So I think to me, it's the, it's the first step. And um, <clears throat> when you go, the next step is to go to editing. And um, I think photographers, um, they have the hardest time to edit their own pictures. And it, it doesn't really matter how famous you are, successful you are. You know, some photographers are okay with editing, some photographers just, just can't, they can't do it, or they, they, they have difficulties. And I, I think there's sort of like, um, I wouldn't call it a trick, but there is sort of something how you can make it easier on yourself how to do it. And so um, you, 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 you kind of, you, know, you put sort of the similar images together and then pick the best and then you realize what should be in, what you, what should be in your narrative. Uh, I think also, Gus, you look very worried. I'm not worried, I'm not worried. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, so, so then you have to, you know, if you have five pictures, you can't say, oh, you know, I'm going to put all four in it, and then later I find out. But you will have to be able to do only one. So do yourself a favor and, you know, pick one or maybe two in, um, in, in, in a category, in a category. And um, I remember working with uh, Gilles Perez, you know, he shoots and shoots and shoots and lots of pictures. And I, uh, uh, we were editing a, a Kosovo or whatever it was, and he at that time he had made little black and white uh, stats, and he just they were all stacked up. And they were like forty different subjects that he had, and you know, and and then we just went through and picked one out of it. So this, you know, you do it digitally now, but you can, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's sort of the same principle that you 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 do this. But I think it's also sort of like you have to be clear already in your mind what you want to do, where do I want to get with this, and you know, is this um, are these pictures at the center or they're maybe on, on the on, on the side, and um, <clears throat> when you uh, when you sort of do your own thinking, um, then I, th I think you also have to sort of really think a little bit. Um, how later you lay it out or you sequence it. Um, you know, there have to be quiet pictures and busy pictures and don't put all, don't put pictures that are not central, put that aside and, and save them because they might help the rhythm of, um, of, the, exhibit, of, the, of, the, of the story or idea. Um, they help it because the next thing that happens is, um, is you have to sequence these things. And um, I think you can make an enormous difference between, you know, putting pictures one after another out without any thinking about it, or sequencing in a, in a way that whoever looks at it um, considers it as, as, as not boring, and consider it that the eye, you know, that basically you are, the eye is following in a, in a certain rhythm. And so when I edit, I always start with a first picture, I pick the first picture and the last picture. And they have different duties. The first picture shouldn't give your idea away. It should be sort of tangentially about the idea, but it shouldn't be the, the, the explanation what, what this is that we have to see. The second picture then, you know, so the, the, the first picture kind of tickles you a little bit and, and it's, a, it's a good photograph. And then the next picture, gives more the idea of what I'm doing. And then on the other end, um, that the last picture I think is, is a really super important because that's what I'm left with. You know, I've looked at this, I go away, and the last picture sort of, you know, sort of sticks in my mind. So it's important that the last picture 
um, is an important photograph or what you want to say and it say, say it strongly. And so you have these brackets and then, um, and then you, do, you do the interior. I mean, you do the, what is between those brackets. And um, depending what the subject is, let's say, um, uh, you know, it could be that someone, you know, tries a tree 50 times, it's the same tree, but you want to say something with it, then of course the pictures are similar. But normally, um, I, I try to vary, uh, you know, this is a portrait, um, this is a, uh, this is a scenery, this is quiet, this is a little busy, uh, this is these colors, these colors can either complement each other or be very different. So just kind of make it um, that whoever looks at it doesn't even realize if, if, if that this has happened. Um, and, and to me, it's always when I, when, when, when I, I do this, I, and, you know, sort of I go through it and I do it again, and then I look at it, and then I trust my feeling, and I sort of look at everything, and then, oh, it sticks here. This is not quite right, you know, I'm, I'm making a change. But when you're done, I, or when, when, when I do this with photographers, I was like, that's it, that's this, we've done it, you know. Um, so uh, there is a little art in doing it, and it's very hard. And sometimes when you don't know whether, you know, whether you should take this picture or that picture, you can ask sometimes, sometimes I ask people and then I know when the person says, that's the better one. And no, it's not, this is the one, you know. So um, sometimes it just helps to, to speak to someone, but do it. it, it can make a huge difference. I mean, I don't know the pictures that I've shown, all of the pictures that I've shown, um, were sequenced, and then hopefully you didn't you didn't know that. But Charles's pictures, you know, I finished with the blossoming tree because that's hope to me, and you know I wanted you all to you know take that away, that you know there is hope, and it's just that tree you know blossoms a little heart out, and it kind of spoke to me. But that so I knew this is the. This is the, the 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 last picture, and you know, in between, you know, I could I could tell you if we went over it again exactly why I had these pictures there, and it's just a tool. It's a tool to make your pictures more forceful. Um, so I I urge you all to go through this exercise, and I I've actually have written something written up, and that can be sent around if if then, uh, Liz, if you can. So you know, if you wanna think about it, you know, or remember what I said. Um, I just want to add, add to Elizabeth's uh, thing too. You know, these are all practices that uh, I incorporate too and that I was lucky to work with her at The New Yorker on those uh, projects that we did there that had lots of pictures, but then also to get feedback, to see her give feedback to other people's books over the years and in my own endeavors. The, the one thing I would add to all of that is the value now more than ever of of creating the analog object that by which you edit. It can't all just happen on screen. I, I feel so strongly, you know, it, you can use Snapfish, you can go to Dwayne Reed and get six set prints, whatever it is. The act of, of having that physical thing, putting it into a sequence and then handing it to somebody and watching them look through it, you see them pause, you see them get bored. All of these things, it's it's this lesson that, that uh, it's totally different than just clicking through, you know, and it, and it doesn't even mean, mean that it has to be that you're making something that wants to become some coffee table book. It's just, it's, it's interacting with your audience in a different psychological way when they're looking at something that's in their hand and is physical and it has a front and a back. So I just would really uh, encourage you, you know, like for every book project I've done for any significant editing, I have printed out so many different versions, small things that I'll keep in my pocket. I'll, I'll make a, uh, stacks of mini lab prints that I'll kind of John Cage on the subway and flutter just to see what will happen. What's this? And then you start to number thing and you, you, you can use chance as well and then fine tune it. And then to also speaking to Elizabeth's point, having that initial thesis statement, that piece of language that guides you, 
but then also knowing that you can go back and then you might learn something through the path of making that sequence that that you then have to revise that thesis statement in some capacity. That's right. It, it's it can work it, with both directions. So it's yeah. it, to use these tools as much as possible. I mean, those of you, you know, uh, there's a number of you who are former students of mine here, and you know all those exercises we've done with titles and the things that I've done at the New York Picture Collection of just saying, okay, here you have 15 minutes to tell a story with 15 pictures from the files tree and bananas and we see what happens and something does happen um, in part because of the time constraints and I think also because it's, it's a physical object and there's just so much pleasure again it's, it's so much more enjoyable to actually be making something every time I find one of my old little things that even is flawed if I still have it in a box it's way better than the, the file uh, on my desktop that I still haven't thrown out uh, and, it, and it can actually teach you something about yourself down the road too so um, yeah that's just something to add Mm. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's like when I worked at the New Yorker, and, and I just knew the photographers who couldn't couldn't edit. Uh, and this is not nasty. You know, I adore Sylvia Plachy, and she has these, you know, she's this wonderful person. But, you know, she's like always over edited, over. You know, I don't know how many pictures. And then she would come in with a show me the contact sheet and you know so with her I always knew and she, she went before presenting it to uh to Remnick you know I would always take extra time and say okay let's go over this and you know have a conversation you know I didn't you know it isn't that I, I you know dictated it but I, I knew you know it was necessary and Remnick David Remnick had no patience you know he I couldn't show him 50 pictures you know no no I mean well you know so um so that's I think I think that's why I'm called a picture editor right <laughs> so uh so I I, I think it, it will um help I was looking I'm looking at, at the, uh, the 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 messages here and someone said from DH to everyone lens space this is now a thing um, so, Gus, do you want to respond, or you know? Well, I feel like, who's on the hook for that in the program? Is that a is that a piece of Charlie language? Where did the lens based? I mean, you should speak to it maybe more than. You're you're muted too. Oh oh oh. oh well, well, Some years it? ago, um, when we began to well, we began the program at SVA, as you know, as a really the first digital minded graduate program uh, back in 88 and we embraced all everything that was digital as quick as it came on and as fast as we could afford to do it um, it became very clear that we were working with the screen <laughs> that was inevitable and video became a part of our program almost immediately I think in the really in the well we had uh, programs in courses in the idea of video, not teaching it per se. But in the second year, Graham Weinbrand and Ed Bowes came on, uh, who are both here, I think. Uh, and we started teaching video. And as the program grew, the integration of, of everything that is lens-based happens really now on the screen. So I invented the title Lens and Screen Arts, which I wanted to replace photography, video, and related media. We have dropped the related media. Uh, unfortunately, we have to go through the State Board of Regents in order to change the title of the program. But I always say, lens and screen art's still in moving. That's what we do as image makers, at least in our program. And I think all photographers and all videographers are very connected uh, if they are trying to be really creative and not just uh, uh, reportage or commercially based. Uh, they're, they're integrating the, the concepts of, of all these disciplines and indeed what can be done digitally and through the network and through the distribution channel of the internet. So Lens and Screen Arts makes sense. Still in moving is the subplot. Does that explain it <laughs> too much? <laughs> also, I love what Richard said too in terms of talking about this responsibility that comes with being a lens-based artist, which somehow fits in with something underlying the DNA of of the people who are also a part of this work, I think. Yeah. I mean, we're editing, we're, we're, we're talking about art right now on the screen, for God's sakes, you know, we're, we're showing pictures in a way we can never show them, and very effectively uh, on the screen. And sometimes we never even make prints anymore, you know? 
good. Maybe it's not, you know, in many ways, it's not necessary. Uh, there's a... Um, yeah, or it is. Or it is. Or it is, or it is you know, so... Yeah, it is or it isn't, yeah. yeah. Or it's both, or it's both. Uh, with the shift of the screen or the re-emphasis, uh, I've noticed most of the literature, a lot of it, has been based on the readers as opposed to the artist. You know, once you make that shift from me to that, then the big question becomes, as they've been talking about this for about 12 years, what happens? And is it different and how is it different? Who are you talking to? Okay, well. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, it's like there's a greater freedom now, you know, um, and everyone, and, and you know, um, I can like many different kinds of images, however they are made, um, maybe because of my age and uh, because of where I worked, I still, um, you know, that there's certain things that are closer to my heart uh, than, than, than others, but uh, I think this freedom is, um, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a good thing. And uh, as Charles said, you know, we now, um, we're watching a lot of it on a screen rather than in, a, in, in, in our hands in a three-dimensional way, um, which means, you know, books can still continue and are continuing, but, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. Something that just jumped in my head that came, uh, I might have mentioned it when, when Charlie, Liz, and Elizabeth, I first spoke, but it was uh, pretty early on in quarantine, there was a panel discussion between mostly photojournalists or people who identify in that kind of tradition. And Susan Mysalis was on it, and uh, she said a wonderful thing at the end that, that has continued to stay with me. And it, it, in some ways, you know, she was really speaking about photographers who come from an analog tradition. But she was making the point that as photographers, and specifically ones from an analog tradition, we've been dealing with the unknown mm -hmm. all along. This idea that you know you, you press the button and you don't know if you got it or what's going to happen or what's going to follow from that. And even though she's speaking about analog, I think that there's something about that 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 still is is uh, can be linked to, to a digital practice. You know, because I think you know the ambitions that we have when we press this button and when we put those four corners around something. Sometimes that's not what actually ends up happening. You never know what, what actually will reveal or be the picture that stays. If we jump 20 years forward, we don't know what are gonna be the seminal images of this moment in time. And that unknowing link to the present at, at once, trying to be fully there, open-hearted, trying to be engaged with the world, making photographs, whatever type they are, is also a conversation with the unknown, even though you're looking at something that's right in front of you. And I think bridging those two and living with that is, is, is a big part of the work. Uh, and hopefully it can be a part of the joy as well. You know, and I think some of the things that Elizabeth and I have been trying to talk about are ways to then sort of live with that and turn it into something, share it, and for all of us as a community of image makers, lens-based artists, um, to do the work that only we can do in this moment and to do it with integrity and authenticity and as much open heart and uh, intellect as we possibly can. So um, to that end, I think we do need to stick together and keep sharing the work and making it. I think it's, it's the strength of, of, of sharing the work that will make this go forward. I like your little mitzvahs. I think your, the title of your next book should be Little Mitzvahs. I think this is. I thought that was big mitzvahs. I think it would sell better, but. <laughs> <laughs> funny, uh, funny, funny, funny. I'm also organizing a bar mitzvah for you, Gus. So oh, I'm inviting <laughs> you to do this. I missed that opportunity. I'm so ready. Yeah. No, uh, we can we can make something happen. Israelis, you know. You have contacts. Okay, I'm a native New Yorker, so I'm part of the way there. You know. But. That's, 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 that's funny. Well, well if it happens, everyone here is invited to the bar mitzvah for sure. Yeah. So, uh, how old do you have to be? 13. 13? 13 to 300. 13 to 40 something. 83 or 83. You know, whatever. 
Um, so shall we ask for more questions, Gus? Would you, uh, I mean, we have a few more minutes. If there's another question, that we're, it's up to you guys, yeah. Is there anything else in the... Oh. I think I recognize someone over there. Somebody else. I think David, Kate, were you? In, uh, do you know me? Oh, he's turned off. I don't know what is he doing, uh, but I think um, he, he was in my editing class. I think one uh, thing, one thing that I thought was really interesting, just jumping back in, um, was when Gus was talking about the black boxes and shared some of those photographs. And then I just, I think I like if you turn your audio and your video off on Zoom, then you also kind of become this anonymous black box within this software that we're talking. Um, so it's just interesting how, how things feel connected. It wasn't a question, it was just a statement. Uh, okay, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I like it, I like it. I'll, I'll look him up. Listen, but I have a question for you, if, if okay. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you feel that when you did, when you're editing for the magazine, um, and now that you're more of a curator, your editing process changed from, you know, the different audiences and with the magazine, there is the article or the story that you have to, you know, you have, you have to match or it, it has to go with, with the article that usually was not written by the photographer. Um, and has your editing changed? at all, if, or anything, as a curator now, that it's not the, the editorial world? Well, in, 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 the, in the, uh, the magazine is sort of a known quantity, right? And, um, and if there is, uh, if, if it, there's an assignment, and, um, and most of the time I've already read the story, or if I haven't read the story, I've talked to the writer, so I know roughly where, where it's going. Um, and I also kind of know what kind of pictures the magazine, shall we say, favors, or the magazine right. has a certain character. Um, so it, 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 you know, I have to keep that in mind, almost subliminally, subliminally, whatever. Um, so, but then if you do, if you do a, a, an exhibition or whatever else you do, I think it's a little freer, and I think you can. Um, you know, I mean, I think even when you edit for the magazine, there's there's the mag, you know, there's a professional taste that I have, and there's also a personal taste. I mean, I happen to be, you know, I, I'm German, and you know, I I, I, ha I happen to sort of like dark pictures, you know, kind of, I favor and and surreal pictures like in Czech photography. I like surreal stuff, you know, but I, I you know, but I can, you know, I have to set that aside if it doesn't fit what what the magazine's about. However, when I do a, 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 a project, it's much more about my, you know, what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do. So I think I'm, 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 I'm freer. And sometimes I don't know what to do. You know, sometimes like, oh, you know, I don't know, should I do it? Is it this, is it that? But I, I think I'm freer when I work on, 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 on projects. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's a different. <laughs> yeah. And is it true that there was a very famous photographer who used to work for you, Avedon, that would only give one picture, the, the picture that will be published? So there was not only- Not always, but most Sorry. of the time. Interesting, okay. <laughs> Thank he you. Had great, he had great freedom. He had- a, uh, Ava, got, It was Avedon, yes. Yeah, yeah. I never, I never got to see the contract, but apparently I'm sure that was in the contract. So- okay. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> David Cade, can you hear me? Ooh, ooh. Elizabeth had a question for you, David. We can't hear you. <laughs> there you go. David? Yes. David? Yes. Elizabeth had a question for you, right, Elizabeth? I'm listening. Uh, no. Uh, yes, yes, he is. Hi. You know me, right? Yes. You were in my, uh, were you in my editing workshop? Yes. See? Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> and nice to see you again. Uh, you also. Speaking yeah. of an editing project, that was quite a project. So, 
anyway, I, just, I thought you had a more specific question for him, Elizabeth. No, 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 no. It was just a hello and. Uh... Nice to see you, David. Yeah. Um... Nice to see all of you. I think we have to come to a conclusion, but uh, these dialogues will continue one way or the other uh, over the next months and years, I hope. And I have to thank Elizabeth and Gus uh, for a sterling, intimate, but engaging dialogue that was structured in a beautiful way to, I think, not only help those of us here who are quite mature and old and done this stuff, but I think in every way for our students and hopefully for the visitors who came in. Uh, this, is, this is what the Lens of Screen Arts are about and becoming a practitioner in this field with serious and personal intent. And, uh, they represent the very best of our field. And thank you both. Uh, I can't thank you enough, actually. Thank you, Elizabeth, for organizing it and everybody for yeah, being here. Elizabeth, Liz. Liz, Liz, I, I met Liz. Uh, <laughs> we, we, well, Elizabeth, Liz. Uh, <laughs> she knew who I met. Uh, yeah. And um, everybody be safe and well and make some pictures and we'll make some video too. Thank you. Yeah, and share it. They create it. Share it, right. And share it, yes. Share Mantra. it. Share it. I'm really grateful to be a part of this community. And uh, if there's any piece of this that of this conversation or dialogue that you want to continue, uh, you know, you, most of you have my email, so please do reach out and uh, and let's just stick together and keep going. So hopefully we can right. be on on bigger boxes soon. <laughs> uh, in person. <laughs> yeah, and in person, exactly, exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you, Charles, Thank for you. having Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Liz. You know, thanks for coming, everyone, for being present. Okay. Bye. <laughs>